I'm really very pleased to participate in this uh, world uh, meeting. Uh, and uh, my topic today is a very specialized and uh, difficult topic. It's about uh, paravalvula percutaneous uh, uh, leaks closure. So, so I'm uh, Fatia Zgal and uh, I work in a teaching hospital in Tunis, that is the, the capital of Tunisia, uh, North African uh, country. So I have no disclosures for this topic. And this is my plan. Let's uh, go through the, the subject. So paravalvula leaks are uh, leaks between uh, the annula, the native annulus of the valve and the prosthetic annulus. So that, that is the definition. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a frequent entity. Its incidence is between five and 18% after a valve replacement. Uh, that's it after surgical valve replacement. But now we are speaking more and more about paravalvular leaks after TIV. So my topic will uh, focus uh, uh, on surgical valve re replacement because TAVR is a very specific topic. And uh, in the uh, regurgitations are more frequent in mitral than uh, aortic uh, valve replacements. This is due to many factors. There are uh, local factors, the anatomy of the valve, particular of the annular uh, tissue, uh, where the surgeon will uh, uh, put the, the prosthetic valve. So if the, the, this tissue is friable, uh, if there is a previous uh, infection, so uh, after an infective endocarditis, there are calcifications. And when the annulus is not circular, because the prosthetic annulus is circular, so they don't match and there, are, there, there is a, a greater probability to have uh, paravalvular leaks. There are also surgical local factors like, like supra, uh, supra annula, position of the aortic valve and continuous sutures after, uh, for the mitral uh, valve when the annulus is reconstructed and when there are difficulties to access to the, this annulus. And very important, every re-intervention, the more number of the intervention, the more risk of having uh, a paravalvular leak. And this is, uh, um, important to know because when we treat a paravalvular leak by redo surgery, the risk of having another paravalvular leak is even greater and we have more and more complications. So there are factors uh, related to the patient as age, endocarditis, uh, denutrition, and the surgeon, of course, uh, uh, and the experience of the surgeon. So, uh, the clinical manifestations of paravalvular leaks are essentially three manifestations. These manifestations are, uh, we described uh, that the, the, this complication occur in uh, five to 18%, but it is uh, frequently asymptomatic. If there is no complication, no clinical manifestation, Generally, it will uh, respect it. And no re-intervention, nor percutaneous, nor surgical re-intervention we will do. So we will, re we will indicate an intervention only in those patients that are uh, rare and uh, in one to 5% of them, we will have uh, either congestive heart failure or Hemolysis. So these are main two complications and manifestations that will indicate uh, re-intervention, either surgical or uh, percutaneous. So uh, 
Congestive heart failure occurs when the uh, paravalvular leak is large, but hemolysis occur rather in moderate and veloce uh, para paravalvular leaks. And there is another complication that can be the cause or the consequence of the paravalvular leak, that is the infectious uh, infection uh, on the cardiacs. And this is very important to know because it will contraindicate, absolutely contraindicate a percutaneous intervention. So we must be attentive to this uh, manifestation that can occur uh, in, in association of the two others. In uh, uh, last uh, American guidelines, so percutaneous intervention was graded to A uh, for patients uh, uh, with uh, with uh, ma clinical manifestations uh, of dyspnea or uh, hemolysis, and uh, for uh, whom the anatomy is uh, suitable for catheter uh, therapy, and uh, with high risk for surgery. This is what is in the guidelines. But more and more, uh, percutaneous closure is indicated in first line. Uh, we spoke to, uh, about uh, re-intervention and we said that the more we re-intervene, the more likely the paravalvular leak will appear again and again. And surgical uh, scores are uh, usually very high in these patients. So uh, in many uh, teams, it is accepted and uh, it's a, a consensus to do percutaneous closure first when the anatomy is suitable, even with reasonable uh, risk, uh, surgery risks. And this depends, uh, about, it depends on uh, the team. So there is a hard team that will decide about this. So uh, this, these are the, the steps that uh, will uh, follow by the, the patient. So, it is very important, uh, the first step, that is the suspicion of paravalvular leak. This is uh, a main step, and uh, I can focus on uh, technical difficulties, and, but the, these are very, very specialized topics. Uh, what is important is to not misdiagnose these patients. So to have a high level of suspicion uh, uh, when the patient presents symptoms of heart failure or unexplained anemia, chronic anemia, this patient uh, should have not only TE, TTE, but also transesophageal uh, imaging, and uh, we will be very careful about the diagnosis. So diagnosis will uh, rely on uh, trans, uh, uh, trans thoracic uh, echocardiography. Sorry, but for the, the slide, always we have to do it first. And uh, trans thoracic uh, so, uh, echocardiography is important and may uh, may be uh, uh, the only uh, needed. Uh, imaging exam when there is an aortic paravalvular leak that is uh, in many times more um, best as assessed by transthoracic echocardiography than transesophageal echocardiography. Uh, it is important also for ventricular functions and pulmonary pressures. The reference and gold standard exam is the TEE and uh, particularly 3D TEE. And this is uh, obligatory and necessary when there is a mitral paravalvular leak. We uh, counsel to do this exam uh, when we have unexplained symptoms. And uh, it is very important for per procedural guidance, as we will see. Fluoroscopy also is very important, uh, particularly when we uh, suspect the swinging annulus and for guiding the procedures. And uh, CT and MRI are, uh, have limited indication, particularly when we have multiple jet aortic regurgitation. 
So this is a case of a patient who is a male patient, 40 year, uh, years old, and he have uh, an, uh, a history of endocarditis and first valvular aortic valvular uh, replacement, then uh, second uh, aortic uh, valvular replacement after after relapse of the endocarditis and uh, permanent pacemaker after the second surgery, and he present with a dyspnea. So we see here, what we see here is uh, an aortic regurgitation. This is aortic root and there is an aortic regurgitation here. So do we think that this patient is suitable for reintervention or is a candidate for reintervention? I put the, this case because it is very important to know uh, the history of the patient. This patient has two episodes of uh, infective endocarditis. So we, have, we should be very attentive uh, to uh, signs of endocarditis. And uh, when we uh, see here the echocardiography, there is an abscess, an aortic abscess here. And on his permanent pacemaker, there are vegetations. So this patient have an infective endocarditis, aortic and pacemaker endocarditis, and he is not a candidate for percutaneous intervention. He is candidate for surgery, but not for uh, percutaneous and intervention, and we should not indicate this procedure. After some days before the surgery was done, the patient presented an aortic aneurysm, false aneurysm, he ruptured the aorta. And uh, hopefully this uh, aneurysm will uh, culminate by a thrombus and uh, he could be uh, operated and he had an aortic root replacement and he survived. So, prima non nocere, uh, uh, absolutely this uh, infective endocarditis contraindicate the percutaneous procedure. And this is the first step we should eliminate when we, uh, when we, we make a diagnosis of a paravalvular leak. The first step is to eliminate an effective endocarditis. There are other relative uh, contraindications are uh, rare, uh, large defects, but this depends on the teams. Some teams, uh, define, define it as a, a defect that is larger than the, the, th the third of the circumference. Also, when there is uh, an annulus swinging and do a fluoroscopy, he uh, help to make uh, the diagnosis. So the imaging is a key tool for uh, assessing paravalvular leaks. Before the procedure, so it uh, can uh, it uh, permit to uh, eliminate or include patients for this uh, indication and planify the uh, the the procedure by planifying the strategy and material that we will uh, do uh, use, particularly occluders and uh, guide. It will guide the uh, the procedure particularly the, the, the septal puncture, the spatial orientation, the occluder positioning, the normal function of the valve prosthesis after positioning the occluder, and the immediate results, and it can detect uh, immediate complications like tamponade. After the procedure, it will help to uh, verify the position because there is secondary embolizations of the gluters, and uh, it will uh, verify the function of the valve prosthesis and uh, residual regurgitation and complication like uh, infective endocarditis. So before the procedure, we, uh, we uh, evaluate anatomy, the number of leaks, the localizations of leak, the quantification of leaks and we planify the procedure. This is uh, mitral regurgitation and in mitral position, we localize the paravalvular leak uh, 
uh, by uh, so watch and uh, from 12 award it is uh, regarding 12 and from 12 to 3 it's a septal side and from 3 to 6 it's posterior side and from 6 to 9 here is the left atrial appendage and this is a lateral side and this is the anterior side so this is a, a consensus to to uh, speak the same language with the surgeon and localize the site of the paravalvular leak on the annula uh, uh, on the mitral annulus and for the aortic uh, for the aortic valve, it, it will be a watch, uh, a mirror watch, and here is the 12, and here is the 6, and we uh, put here the non-coronary side, here the right side, and here the left side. For the quantification of the, the, the leak, um, classical parameters like vena, vena contractor and PISA are, uh, uh, are not suitable to estimate paravalvular leaks and they are misleading and uh, usually they don't uh, give good results. And so we should know this uh, information because uh, we, saw, we see many um, misclassification and misdiagnosis uh, because uh, people use classical uh, parameters that, that are not uh, suitable for paravalvular leak. So we can uh, evaluate the circumference of the leak and uh, to assess its uh, uh, severity. And we uh, rely, uh, we rely to on uh, we rely on hem hemodynamic effect. And uh, I see, I say again, uh, clinical manifestations are very important for the indication. And to predict the difficulty of the procedure, many uh, parameters were uh, studied. So uh, in two D and three D echocardiography we can uh, study the, 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 the wild so of the, the paravalvular leak, its localization, because lateral and anterior localization are, for mitral valve, are uh, uh, less difficult, much less difficult than septal and posterior uh, sides that are difficult to reach. So when we do an anterograde approach, from the, uh, the interceptor uh, 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 so, uh, so the we can re difficultly reach the septal side and posterior side. This may indicate another approach like apical uh, approach. We will see the, this uh, after. And angulation, linearity and classifications are also parameters of uh, procedural uh, difficulty. I show you this uh, second case. It's a second uh, 56-year-old uh, male, and he also had uh, a, a history of uh, endocarditis and aortic valve replacement, and he present with uh, uh, dyspnea. Uh, he 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 have uh, he has a, a mild uh, anemia, and uh, we show in, uh, on uh, echocardiography uh, uh, an aortic regurgitation. The diameter of the aortic regurgitation was uh, four millimeters on echocardiography. And this could be misclassified as moderate, but we see here on, on geography that it was uh, an important uh, aortic regurgitation. And hemodynamic and clinical manifestations indicate that it was uh, an important uh, aortic regurgitation. So the patient had has a, pro a procedure that is, was guided essentially by. 
uh, transthoracic and transesophageal 2D echocardiography only. Uh, we didn't have 3D this uh, when the procedure was done. And uh, it uh, relies mainly on fluoroscopy. And here is a chair for classical guide wire that uh, crossed the defects. And then it was uh, replaced by a stiff double angulated uh, wire. And then here the occluder that was a duct occluder was positioned in the defects. And this is uh, the occluder and the definitive re result with no aortic regurgitation. So, the patient's after that, that was uh, totally asymptomatic and recovered his professional activity. He had no longer used uh, diuretics and his hemoglobin was uh, good. I have to say that uh, hemolysis is much more frequent with mitral uh, uh, paravalvular leaks than with, with award paravalvular leaks because when the ventricle ejects, the, the jet is more turbulent and uh, uh, causes more hemolysis than where there is an award regurgitation. And uh, the patient uh, does very well after that. So for the aortic valve, we can use uh, a retrograde or an anterograde uh, approach. For the mitral valve, we can use a retrograde, uh, uh, usually we, uh, we use uh, an anterograde transeptal approach, but alternatives are retrograde trans or aortic approach when there is no uh, prosthesis on the aortic valve, but uh, many of our patients have had a double replacement. So, and uh, another alternative, particularly for septal defects, is transapical uh, approach. So all this is discussed after the, uh, the imaging evaluation and assessment. So we assess the leak, we assess the, uh, the, the, the anatomy, the feasibility of uh, the procedures, and we, we assess the patient and his surgical risk. And finally, we discuss with a heart team where there is uh, a surgeon to, uh, with the, the, the anesthetic, uh, anesthetic uh, specialist and the cardiologist, and we discuss uh, every procedure because uh, every procedure is have its particularities. There is no specific, specific geometry. It's, uh, every patient is unique by his history, by his uh, anatomy, and uh, we uh, discuss all the cases. And um, also there is uh, a severe prognosis which uh, uh, choice we make by, sur uh, by indicating uh, surgery, a medical treatment, or a percutaneous treatment. We know that uh, these patients have uh, very high uh, rates of morbid mortalities. These are the devices, and uh, we saw that uh, for our patients, we use it duct occluder. So there is many off-level occluders. You can use uh, atrial septum, ventricular, ventricular septum, atrial septum, occluders, vascular plaques, and there is uh, occlutec that designed specific occluders for paravalvular leaks, but they still, uh, they, are, they uh, don't have FD, uh, they are not uh, FD approved uh, yet. We switched to another case, a 63 years old female 
that had had uh, dyspnea uh, on in history. So we have uh, rheumatism, valve disease. She had three surgery before that. So an open commissurotomy in 86, and then a mitral valve and a water valve mechanical uh, replacement, and then uh, in 2014, and another replacement, the mitral replacement, because of, of paravergular leak in 2017. So these are the patients that we treat. They are uh, hard patients with hard, with um, heavy uh, history, with uh, many comorbidities. She presented with uh, uh, heart failure and uh, hemolysis and an anemia of uh, seven uh, grams per deciliter. And she had a septal side mitral valve defect. So it was far, far, uh, four o'clock. And this is uh, an anatomic difficulty. This localization, I said, uh, but uh, it was uh, uh, very difficult to reach by an anterograde approach. We made an anterograde approach and not an apical approach, but our um, interventionist make uh, an innovative technique. He uh, used uh, uh, a standard drip jeans and uh, he made a V-shaped loop in the uh, left atrium. And uh, I, um, I don't uh, didn't say that this patient this patient have an old uh, an, uh, an atrial septal defect, uh, posterior and uh, posterior and atrial septal defect. So this is uh, another difficulty because from this position it is very difficult to reach the septal side of the mitral annulus. But uh, our interventionist used this atrial septal defect and made, made a loop in the, uh, 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 in the atrium and reached by this technique the defect and could cross it by uh, the uh, guide. Afterward, he uh, exchanged this uh, guide by a stiff guide and uh, uh, ended the loop. And uh, could uh, place successfully a, a vascular plug of eight millimeter to uh, to close the, the defect. This is the, the septal defect and the wire crossing uh, crossing the, the septal defect, and here the the wire, it makes a loop in the atrium and reach the the leak. And the procedure was uh, successful with only mild. This is after the procedure. So we have here the occluder, the vascular plug, and only a mild regurgitation, residual regurgitation. So I uh, so can continue if I have a bit time with another case, or uh, I move to the conclusion. Yeah, please. yes, please. Uh, we are running out of time. Very rapidly, so I will not uh, focus on uh, clinical. Uh, but this is a man with a uh, mitral valve replacement, and here is a uh, uh, lateral paravalvular leak. So it's a good position to close uh, by an anterograde approach. But the difficulty here that it was very large. So we place uh, three. So we, we see here we had uh, three guides. And uh, we place three uh, occluders to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to close this defect successfully. But and hopefully this patient, this patient, died after uh, some months 
from infective endocarditis. So I see that uh, I say that because uh, I insist that every procedure, every indication uh, must be uh, really uh, studied in depth with the heart team. It's, these are uh, always difficult patients and difficult prognosis and difficult procedures. And even when we succeed immediately procedures, we can have hemolysis in the mitral position, particularly if we have a mild residual regurgitation. So the patient may uh, present first by, uh, uh, for uh, congestive heart failure because of a large paravalvular leak. But if, yes, but if the closure is incomplete, we can uh, have a hemolysis secondary. So uh, it is less invasive uh, than a surgery. Safe, I don't know. But it is uh, generally salvative and uh, the patient when it is succeeded so the patient uh, goes really very very well uh, after these are the complications and we insist to say that all these procedures have many complications so uh, uh, my take-home messages are uh, we have to do uh, uh, Full, the full investigation of patients who have prosthetic valve and present with anemia or dyspnea that is not well uh, understood or not uh, where the cause is not uh, evident. Uh, there is a severe out, uh, clinical outcome and uh, heavy economic consequences of this entity and significant morbidity or more of more and mortality. Uh, with uh, percutaneous closure is really promising, but uh, uh, is now called by some people orphan procedure because we have no dedicated devices, no industry support because these cases are rare and uh, not really uh, supported by industry and uh, no supported by insurance. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very well uh, presented um, thing. Um, I must say it is uh, making